today we're going to continue our discussion of liquids and solids and we're going to mainly talk about solids and the different types and how they are bonded. There are two main types of solids, crystalline or am amorphous. Uh, and crystalline has an orderly arrangement of components. It's a crystal structure and it has what's called a lattice. This is a 3D system of points. So if you think of like a lattice fence, it's that you know, the crossing. Um, so we've got these points designating the positions of the components. And we have what's called a unit cell, which is basically the smallest repeating unit. So if you think about a lattice fence, it basically that diamond shape is kind of the unit cell, and then that just keeps repeating over and over and over again. Uh, the other type, amorphous, has a disorderly arrangement. So it's not as structured. It's also not as common. Uh, glass is an example of this. The components get frozen in place before they achieve order. So if we take a look at um, these two examples, let me get my pen real quick. Um, we have, they're both composed of the same elements, but yet their structure is very different. So this is quartz. If you think about quartz, it's a very crystal type of rock. Um, and so it's got this orderly arrangement, whereas amorphous, it's not very orderly. I mean, here we've got a little bit of orderliness, but it's, it's kind of scrambled up. Okay, so we can also look at solids through an, using an x-ray. And this is called x-ray diffraction. So it's a scattering of light related to the wavelength. Um, and so basically, where the waves are in phase, in phase, which means the peaks and the peaks are lining up, that's getting reinforced, and so those are the light colored areas. And then the dark areas are where the waves are out of phase. So if we have a peak or a, a crest and a trough, that would be out of phase, and basically they're going to cancel out, and so that's going to give a dark area. We can use what's called the Bragg equation to solve for uh, the wavelength, the distance between the atoms, or the angle um, of incidence and reflection that those waves are, are hitting at, so they're you know crossing. And so that's called the Bragg equation. So if we take a look at a couple of these examples, the diffraction pattern of x-ray beam passing through aluminum foil, here we have uh, where the waves are in phase. It's very light. And then these dark areas are where the waves are out of phase and they're canceling each other out. We can use a diffractometer um, to do this x-ray analysis. So let's take a look at what one of those looks like. Uh, not super exciting. Most of the exciting stuff occurs on the inside. Um, but basically, we put our sample, and then we can adjust our angle. And you know, in the end, we get this picture of where these waves have either enforced or um, canceled out. OK, so using the Bragg equation, try this example. So we have an x-rays um, of a wavelength of 1.54. That A with the little circle is an angstrom. It's just a um, length measurement. It's very small. Um, and so we have a reflection produced at 19.3 degrees. We're going to assume n equals 1 because n is just an integer. And we want to calculate the distance between the planes of atoms producing this reflection. OK, so take your Bragg equation from the previous slide, plug in. And um, maybe you want to go ahead and pause the video for a few minutes, try this, and then um, I'll give you the answer. So go ahead and pause. I'm going to move on, but you guys try this example, and then we'll go over. Well, I'll give you the answer. Okay, so hopefully you got an answer of 2.33 angstrom. So that just gives you the distance between the planes of the atoms. Okay, so we talked about the two main types of solids. So now let's talk about some types of crystalline solids, since those are more common. Um, we can have ionic solids which have ions at the lattice points. Remember we said we have that unit cell, and those lattice points give the position of the components. We can also have molecular solids, which have covalently bonded molecules at the lattice points. Or we can have atomic solids, which have atoms at the lattice points. So hopefully you're seeing a pattern here with different substances at the lattice points. We have three groups of atomic solids. There's a metallic solid, which would include uh, delocalized non-directional covalent bonding between our metals. Um, we can have a network solid, which is a giant molecule, lots of bonds going on. And then we can also have group 8A solids. Eight, group 8A are the noble gases, and so these get attracted with London dispersion forces, which if you remember from before, are you know the, kind of the lowest type of intermolecular force, and they get stronger as we add, as our molecule gets larger. 
Okay, so uh, you may want to pause the video again, but try these. We've got the three main types of solids, and so see if you can identify them. So go ahead and pause the video, and then we're going to go over the answers. Okay, so hopefully what you figured out was that this was a molecular solid, okay, because we've got molecules of what I would assume is carbon dioxide at each of the lattice points. Hopefully you identified this as ionic because it looks like we've got probably a sodium chloride uh, crystal, so our big chlorine and our small sodiums. And then hopefully you identified this as an atomic crystalline structure because it looks like just one atom and each atom is at the last point. Okay, so let's look a little more deeply into the structure and bonding in metals. So we can have basically two main types, and we'll talk about a third type in a minute. Um, metals want to be closest packing, which means they, they don't want any space between the atoms. And so we have these uniform structures made up of hard spheres, usually in layers, and with closest packing, they are usually surrounded by six other atoms. We can have two main organizations of this type of structure. Uh, we can have hexagonal closest packed and then cubic closest packed. And they follow what we call this ABA arrangement or this ABC arrangement. So if we look at hexagonal closest packed, we have our A layer on the bottom. Okay, and then basically the B layer fills in, if you think about you know, two circles together and you made a layer out of them, there's going to be these spaces, right, because they're circles. So even though they're touching, there's some space around them. So that B layer fills in on top of the A layer. So it basically goes into all the little gaps or all the little dimples on the A layer. And then another A layer goes on top. And so we just keep repeating this A, B, A, B, A, B all the way. And that's why we're designating it with this abbreviation. The other type is cubic close packed. It's ABC because we have three different layer arrangements. So we have our pink one on the bottom, which is A. Okay, and then we have B on top, very similar to what's going on over here. Okay, but then instead of stacking directly underneath the A again, it's oriented the other direction, and so it's filling in the opposite way, and so we have this kind of staggered effect here with the three different layers. Okay, so let's try an example with this. Based on what the unit cell looks like, we can figure out density. Okay, so we have silver crystallizes in a cubic closest pack structure, and I've given you a picture of the unit cell. The radius of a silver atom is 144 picometers. Uh, one picometer, or one times 10 to the 10 picometers is equal to one centimeter, so they're pretty small. And we want to calculate density. Okay, so I want you to try this one, but let me give you a few hints first. You know that density equals mass over volume. Okay, so let's solve for these two parts individually and then plug them in. So to get mass, we know based on the periodic table, we know the number of grams in one mole of atoms. Okay, and we can also use Avogadro's number to figure out the number of atoms in one mole. And so we can basically go from moles, or sorry, from atoms to gr moles to grams using Avogadro's number and atomic mass. But we need to know how many atoms there are in one unit cell of silver. Well, if we take a look at this picture, we know that the radius of a silver atom is 144 picometers. So that's from this point to here. Okay, and we also know, let's see, we've got these half atoms. So if we put these two together, we'd get one atom. And then we have the same thing going on on the other side, so that's two atoms. And then we have this top, and there's one on the bottom. You can't see it, so that's three. And then we've got, whoops, um, these little eighth of an atom corners. And so since there's eight of them, that means in cubic closest packed that there are four atoms total. And so we can go from there to moles, and we can go from there to grams, and that's going to give us our mass. Okay, now let's think about volume. We need to find basically the volume of this cube. Well, we know that the radius is 144 picometers. So here's one radius, here's two radii, here's three, and here's four. So if we, since it's a cube, we know that the sides are all the same. So this is side, side. This is equal to 4R. And so since this is a right triangle, we can use Pythagorean's theorem to find 
one of the sides. And then we know that that side cubed is going to equal our volume. And we can put that right there. Okay, keeping in mind that our radius is equal to 144 picometers. Okay, so go ahead, pause the video, try finding the density on your own given what we have talked about, and then um, I'll give you the answer after you've played the video again. So go ahead and pause it right now, and then um, I'll give you the answer. Okay, so hopefully you have paused the video and worked through this. Um, and they give you the separate pieces just because there is a lot of information involved. Your volume should be 6.76 times 10 and 7. There's your mass. And here's your density. I gave it to you. Oops, this should be superscripted. I gave it to you in grams per picometer. Or if you converted picometers to centimeters, it should be 10.6 grams per centimeter. So we can go over that in class if you have any questions. Okay, like I said, we also have this third organization, and they are not the closest packing. This is called body-centered cubic. It's called this because we have one full atom in the center, and so it's body-centered. And so then we have these spheres um, along the diagonal of the cube they will all touch. Alkali metals will usually form this type of structure. And it's not really well understood why a particular metal adopts a particular structure, so it, we don't know a whole lot about that yet. Okay, so let's talk about some bonding metal models for metals. So the physical properties of metals indicate that the bonding is very strong, but that it's non-directional because it's very difficult to separate the atoms, but it's really easy to move them as long as they are still connected. So if you think about some of the properties of metals, they're malleable, ductile, so again, we can move them really easily, but they're hard to separate. Uh, they're efficient and they have an efficient and uniform conduction of heat and electricity. Okay, that relates back to the ease of movement. They're also durable, but they have a high melting point, and so that relates to their difficulty to separate. Another, a better way to describe this is to use the electron C model. Basically, we have these metal cations, remember those are positive, and a C of valence electrons. And so these valence electrons don't really belong to any one metal ion. They're just kind of all floating around with the positive ions from the metal. So the mobile electrons are what are conducting your heat and electricity. And the metal ions are easily moved around, okay, because they're not, they're just in the sea of electrons, so we can move them a lot. They're just really hard to separate. A more specific model is the band model, which is related to the molecular orbital model. Remember, we talked about that in some previous chapters. We had the bonding and the antibonding with the, you know, the different orbitals. And so in the band model, electrons travel around the metal crystal in molecular orbitals that are formed from the valence atomic orbitals of those metal atoms. So instead of having this cloud, we take those valence electrons and put them in these orbitals. Well, the thing with metals, though, instead of having these widely spaced molecular orbitals, remember we had the sigma down here and the, the antibonding way up here, um, since we have lots of metal atoms, lots of molecular orbitals, basically firm, forms this, like, continuum of levels, so all these levels, and so we call them bands because they're kind of all so close together. So empty molecular orbitals and full molecular orbitals are very close in energy, and that's why we have this thermal and electrical conductivity of metal crystals, and so we have a lot of these highly mobile electrons, remember they're easily moving around, um, we have all these electrons in these partially filled bands, and so we get a lot of conduction. So we're taking all those levels, and because they're so close and there's so many, we're calling it a band instead. And this is the same with why they're so good at conducting heat also. The electrons are moving rapidly, so they can conduct heat and electricity. So here's just kind of a picture of what we're talking about. If you remember, we had, you know, obviously not this many orbitals, but we had our bonding and our antibonding. Okay, maybe we had something like two or three. Well, with metals, since we have so many more electrons and so many more molecular orbitals, it just gets to be a lot, and so we just basically call it a band instead. Okay, so last little thing we're going to talk about are alloys. Alloys are really common with metals. So a metal alloy is a, basically a mix of two or more different elements with metallic properties. And so there are two different types. We can have a substitutional alloy, which if you think about it, is something is being substituted, and so one of the metals is replacing other metal atoms, and they kind of have to be similar sized, and so some examples of this would be brass, 
Uh, brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. So a third of the copper gets replaced by the zinc atoms. They're similar in size. Another one would be sterling silver. Uh, it's 93% silver and 7% copper, and so they are similar in size. The other main type is an interstitial alloy. And so basically what happens is you have these really smaller metals that fill in the holes or the spaces in the closest packed structure um, of those bigger atoms. And so, for example, steel, the carbon atoms are a lot smaller, so they fill in the holes of an iron crystal. Uh, presence of the interstitial atoms changes the properties of the alloy. Steel is really strong. Okay, so it's a combination of properties of the carbon and the iron. So an alloy steel is where both alloy types mix, get mixed together, and so like, bike frames are really strong but really light, and so we're, we're taking a substitutional alloy and an interstitial alloy and putting them together. Okay, so um, you may want to pause the video for a second, but go ahead and try to identify what each of these uh, types of alloys is. And I will also tell you that one of them is not an alloy, it is a pure metal. And so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can identify these real quick. I'll give you time for that, and then we'll go over the answers. Okay, so hopefully you have paused the video and figured these out on your own. A and D are both substitutional alloys. The other metal is replacing some of that initial metal. B is a pure metal. It's only one type of metal, no alloy, actually. And C is an interstitial alloy, so those small ones are replacing in the spaces. Okay, so go ahead and get started on the homework. Hope you have a good day.